Fiji Women's Crisis Centre noted an increase in domestic violence cases in the country since the second wave of COVID-19. From the month of April till August last month, the centre has received around 600 calls per month on their helpline. 70% of these calls are related to domestic violence. The centre's coordinator, Shamima Ali, says job losses and poverty has been a contributing factor to domestic violence and marital rape. While the lockdown and restrictions were good for COVID, survivors of domestic violence have noted otherwise. Of course, we have very high rates of domestic violence in this country. The last survey, which we did in partnership with the Bureau of Fiji Bureau of Statistics in 2011, showed very high rates, 64% of women were survivors of domestic violence. So, um, so given that, you know, uh, the, 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 we already had the, the gender inequalities, the patriarchal systems, all those things that are the causes, the main causes. But the contributing factors is the job losses and so on, being together. It's physical abuse, sexual abuse, marital rape. We're seeing an increase in the number of marital rapes reported, rape within marriage at home, um, and also a lot of uh, coercive control. Coercive control meaning uh, you know, the perpetrator types, not all these are the perpetrator type men, eh? the ones who are perpetrating. Uh, total control on the woman. She can't even make a phone call, taking her text, where she's going. She can't even talk to people, uh, you know, like monitoring all her movements and so on, and a lot of emotional abuse. So, you know, frustrations that men have often, they take it out on the vulnerable because they also have lost jobs. They don't know what to do. Usually they, the patriarchal system makes them very much in control of their lives. You know, they know what to do about their families, provide their families, protect their families, put food on the table and then buy the things and so on. So they are quite frustrated. And often men who are of this nature already perpetrating type men, they will take out on the vulnerable. So they are taking out on the women. And, uh, you know, uh, a lot of uh, these people, families have, have been paying mortgages they have bought cars, you know, they're on the upward swing as far as, you know, their, 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 uh, their social life is concerned. But this has suddenly brought an end to all of that. So people have had to give up their homes that they have already paid quite a bit of money for. They've had to give up their homes, their cars, and have tried to adjust to a different um, lifestyle, which is, which sometimes is not as well as they would like it to be. And then you've got the poor people who already are underprivileged. And the latest, uh, you know, the census results are showing us just how bad poverty is in this country. We already had an existing problem of poverty. And now with the, the pandemic, it has become worse. So, you know, we have crowded homes where people, you know, live eight, nine, 10, up to 14 in a house. And they're always in each other's ways tempers rise you know we don't know how to deal with these things and we are not a society that talks to each other that talks about feelings that shares its grief its sorrows its um uh, you know concerns and so on so with all of that it's a, a, a very um uh, sort of right place uh, you know it becomes very conducive for this kind of violence it's also violence against children violence against people with disabilities in the home, violence against the elderly also. That is also something that we are, uh, you know, uh, recording uh, in these past few months. Calls have been made for enforcement agencies to be more facilitating to survivors of domestic violence. Well, some of the challenges, well, one of the major challenges we've seen is the lack of understanding in terms of understanding the domestic violence, the gendered nature of domestic violence. Because the courts, legal aid, the police, they don't take a gender perspective when dealing with survivors of domestic violence. The way that they respond to the survivors is usually with insensitivity, uh, it's without any empathy, and it sort of discourages survivors as well from accessing the services that they so greatly need. And one of the things that we've noticed in terms of enforcement agencies, uh, like the police, is that uh, they, don't, they lack the understanding of the law. That's one. The other, they don't even know the law. So we have to then take time out to educate them on the different laws that exist. And what happens because they don't know the law, the, uh, uh, the, the rights of survivors, the, uh, the protection that survivors get under the law is not given to them. So when we do the education, 
one thing that the service providers need to understand the time that we're taking up to then educate you on the different types of law with survivors of domestic violence time is of essence it makes a difference between life or death and one of the things with domestic violence we've also seen is perpetrators use the system to further inflict further violence on the survivors they take the children away from the from the mothers we've seen during this past four months we've been an increase in number of child recovery cases that we've had to do and one of the things that we've seen is the lack of empathy and sensitivity that the service providers specifically the courts and legal aid has given to survivors we've had a case where they had to transfer it from Singatok all the way to Nandi, Nandi without due notice as to how survivors are going to get from one jurisdiction to another so that's some of the major uh, difficulties that we have seen in terms of enforcement for survivors. And because the protection is there for, under the law, most of the survivors don't get it because our enforcement agencies, because our service providers don't understand the law and don't know it. We've also had to do, the lawyers have been busy uh, mm -hmm. doing child recovery cases where the perpetrators to punish the woman further, particularly if she wants to do something about it, she wants to move out of the relationship, mm -hmm. they are absconding with the children. So she's looking around for the children and going to court. And during this time where we have to take all the COVID precautions and so on. So, you know, it becomes very, very difficult for women. And, uh, and there are, you know, like this is how they make use of the law, the men are. And so our lawyers, people like Stephanie and other, uh, other people from our legal team are involved with quite a few child recovery cases at the, uh, during this period. How can the public assist in combating domestic violence? We've always said, don't be bystanders. One is we have to not accept domestic violence as the norm, just because a woman is living with a man or is, is married to the man or any two partners together, you know, we, and if one beats up the other, it doesn't mean, and particularly men beating up their wives, uh, they, they, if we should not see it as the norm. We must intervene. Don't be mere bystanders. If your neighbor is getting beaten up, you know that is happening. Please call the toll-free line 1560. We'll get the police onto it. Some people don't want to get involved. We'll treat you as, uh, as you know, your case is confidential. So, you know, help that person, support that person. If you get a chance, talk to the perpetrator. If it's happening within your family, you can do a lot to stop it. How we talk to our girls and boys about respect for women. You know, those things matter and we need to start doing that. But please support the survivor. survivor. Do not side with the perpetrator. He is committing a crime. Do not support him. Because if you keep supporting him, he will continue the violence. And one day it can end up in suicide, in a death, death. it can end up in murder. So please don't be bystanders. That was, that's what we say to the, uh, to the uh, public. And please don't forget that toll free line 1560. With the increase in sexual crimes, reports have shown that the age of perpetrators are getting younger, the youngest being an 11-year-old. Shamima says while child rape has always been there, the new trend is where young men are now becoming perpetrators. One of the, one of the contributing factors to this, to rape and other kinds of devious sexual assaults and so on on, people's, on people, particularly, especially on women, sometimes boys also, um, is, is, is pornography. The easy access now where, you know, young people have that access on their phones, very readily available. Lack of supervision in the homes of what our children are, are watching. Because we are so busy as adults, if the easy thing is I'll give them a tablet, give them a laptop, give them a phone, you know, and, and when you can't afford it, they will watch it on other people's phones. When you see a group of young people together, very avidly watching something, check it out, you know, and things like that. So that, you know, pornography is about um, violence against women. It's a form of violence against women. And it shows women in very, uh, like accepting all kinds of sexual things done to them and so on. So young people, the mind is very impressionable. So they get desensitized to pain, to, because the women who are portrayed in this, they are liking it sort of. So how can we protect our women and girls? I've been saying this for years, is that we cannot stop rape. Women and girls cannot stop it. 
it's entirely in the hands of men and of perpetrator type men and society who can stop it we can do everything to protect our girls keep them at home we keep them at home they get raped by their relatives you know 80% of rapists are known to the survivor of that 80% 50% are relatives people in places of trust who are doing this to them so we cannot say lock them up don't let them go out at night rape can happen at any time it will it happens anywhere any place at any time it happens to children as young as 4 months to women as old as 90 years you know so actually what we can do is we can build confidence in our girls confidence about how to you know how to walk how to talk walk with confidence you know up their self esteem so they can talk back to people who sexually harass them and so on you know giving them that confidence empowering our girls as they growing up teaching our boys respect when we see perpetrator type behaviors it starts from sexual harassment and so on. even within the family you know the tovu the you know the the all the cultural relationship stau uh, and uh, the the vetavaleni the you know in indian in the indo fijian community we have uh, things like you know joking with the wife's uh, younger sister so sometimes it goes to extremes when we see and the young people are very uncomfortable with all of that you know all the men doing that so when we see things like that intervene intervene you know because culture also has its limits you know you can't do go beyond and there's a certain age so we must intervene all the time when we see things that are making us uncomfortable around girls you know some men are doing this kind of things we feel uncomfortable don't turn away talk intervene talk tell him this is not acceptable behavior encourage the girls to speak up when they talk about these things even if it's grandpa it's daddy step daddy brother uncle momo whoever it is if they talk about them and turn up listen to them that we start addressing this behavior as it happens from young old and the communities need to stay stand up and even the courts have put it in their judgments to say that you really need the whole community to come together to address this issue so it's very important to understand that some of them will say what is defilement so if you're having sex with someone that is below the age of 16 and above the age of 13 if the person does consent you still will be charged with defilement of a young person between 13 years old and 16 years old rape is when someone has not consented they have either and when they have not given their free consent meaning they were not forced uh to give their consent they were not threatened to do it they do, they were the person the perpetrator did not use the authority and also they did not misrepresent the fact meaning they did not say that if you slept with me we've seen some cases where they have said that in order for you to get to heaven that i would have to sleep with you so if they didn't commit it by a false rep- uh, misrepresentation then that would definitely not be right but if they if consent is not given because of these things uh, the of the point that I've already given earlier then obviously that is rape so just What to keep in mind 13? yeah anyone below the age of 13 automatically is incapable of giving consent and that's very important so if they are 12 years old 11 years old automatically it will be statutory rape There are times when perpetrators could use culture as an excuse for harassment. People need to know that these actions could be held accountable. For judiciary, once a case is then produced in court, uh, DPP usually makes an application, especially if the survivor is vulnerable. They would have special provisions, meaning if the survivor is put in a room on themselves, they can use Skype so that the survivor doesn't have to face the perpetrator. Uh, the other special provision that they have, especially for children, is that where they have Skype in a different room and then you have an interpreter in between so that the survivor doesn't have to speak directly to the perpetrator the other things one of the i think the faults that we have seen at least is that in terms of rape survivors the insensitivity of the questions being asked survivors are badgered with questions like why didn't you scream uh, if that was your relative and if it did really happen why didn't you tell your father immediately after it came why didn't you cry So these are usually and it reinforces uh, they start questioning as to whether you did consent you two were in a relationship and then another thing that also plays a part in terms of these uh, especially rape cases is the perpetrator if he is a famous rugby player if he is a police officer and long standing 
they usually try and play up what he has achieved or what he has done to the survivor and that also what they'll say child so that's one of the things that we have seen especially for rape survivors when the focus start focusing on what the perpetrator has achieved over what he has done to the survivor and that's some of the things that we need to address and that would help with sensitization of the judges or of the lawyers of the police and all those that are involved in that case because that's the only way we can address this issue and ensure that the survivor comes out better off than when she entered the system a lot of the survivors don't have trust in the system because they know what's going to happen when they get in instead of asking okay how can i help you they're asking okay why were you there why were you wearing that particular dress who told you to be with those group of boys so these are things that we i, I believe that gender sensitized training would help and that's we've seen products where we have done gender sensitized training of our law enforcement our lawyers and they have yielded uh, results in terms of how they have responded to survivors only 5% of rape are usually reported in the country the covid pandemic has also made the work of the protection of women difficult given that you know we believe because they are home now and most of the rapes are by people they know we are not hearing enough so that means that they are not talking about it they are not coming out we're getting a few trickling in there are some there were that were already existing in the last two months we've had a, a, a slight increase in the numbers with uh, reporting but not as many as we get when we are doing face to face counseling in normal times so that is a worry and my cry out to people is please look out for this look at your children talk to them about it tell them give them confidence to report to talk to you about it marital rape yes definitely because domestic violence is being reported along with that marital rape is being reported but we are believing there must be a lot more perhaps when we open our doors face to face counseling uh, begins we are back in our offices we are expecting higher numbers reporting in an influx of people reporting this The Fiji Women's Crisis Center receives 600 calls a month and of that 3% are for suicide. Center coordinator Shamima Ali says FWCC counselors are trained to deal with suicide cases and refer them to the relevant agencies. I know there's a huge hole out there that they feel they're spiraling towards and so on. So, you know, so these are the things that drive people there. what we have seen is and you know the also the 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 issue of we don't have the kind of networks we should be having we don't have those kind of networks that uh, that that supports people we don't have a culture of where we can talk to each other about these things and uh, and so on so you know there we are seeing domestic violence definitely over the years the crisis center has been around Uh, domestic violence issues where she feels she has got nowhere to go she comes to us she has got suicidal thoughts our counselors have had to train to get training to be able to deal with that or do the referrals to the right people who understand domestic violence who understand rape there are people who have been raped particularly by family members a lot of self harm we are seeing in that area suicidal thoughts and really we have seen we have dealt with some people who have were coming to us but have actually committed suicide so so um at right now we are so and you know so and people also don't go and get help right now we are getting some suicidal calls uh and about you know all the calls that we are getting 70% domestic violence and so on uh between 3 to 5% we are seeing who are suicidal suicide with suicidal thoughts and uh, domestic violence definitely one of them uh he has abandoned her and gone off with another woman relationship issues that's another one uh, another cause where you know he has left her she has left him and they feel and particularly with younger people women who have nothing you know who don't have any financial support who don't have any family support and he has abandoned her uh women who have become pregnant and the guy runs away absconds you know he runs away leaving her high and dry and no support whatsoever so this is these are the kind of things we are seeing now a lot of people are calling up uh for uh, uh 
money problems of what has happened during the pandemic of not being able to survive not being able to put food on the table and with women doing all the work looking after children looking after huge households and also having to deal with marital rape with domestic violence and so on according to statistics from the month of january to july this year out of the 47 suicide cases recorded 11 were female if you look at that stats 11 are female that means the rest are men so you know people might also wonder why men so we know you know, men are not able to cope better. The women are very resilient. They're able to cope better. They're used to the hard life and, you know, and, and, and coming through it all and they can talk to each other. They can have a good cry. They can, you know, so, and they keep on and keep on. When men, often their lives are very well ordered, you know, so, and all of a sudden this pandemic happens or a disaster happens and they've lost everything. So it's very hard for them to contemplate that. Their manhood is somehow lost. So, you know, so they are, uh, you know, doing, uh, men are also going through this and, and we're seeing higher numbers. It's always been, even before the pandemic. But for us, the men who are calling us, we have got five male advocates and we do the referrals to them. When men call the 1560 line or any of our lines, crisis center lines, uh, we refer them to these five male advocates. They have been trained to deal with men, so they talk to them, listen to them, you know, where, where they can share their feelings and so on. So we, we do that. And for the crisis center, the women who are calling us, again, counseling, long-term, prolonged counseling, talking to them, or we can also refer them to uh, Lifeline. Uh, the number is 1543-1543, toll-free, Lifeline, and Empower Pacific. 5626, that's again a toll free line. So there are all these lines. So I would just say to people, please access these lines. They are there. Talk to someone about it, you know? And uh, I think the, you know, and we also encourage families to talk to each other, have a conversation time, trust each other, you know, and, and talk to each other about these things. And, you know, life is too good, it, it's too precious to lose it like that. You know, there are other things in life. Your problem might seem, very very big right now but uh, you know there are people who can help you out i know in fiji we don't have as many outlets as we would like and particularly with the pandemic the children the elderly the women the men almost everyone of all ethnicity we are going through all of this but please access the lines that are available so during the counseling the problem might be a legal one child recovery dvro uh, sexual harassment, you know, all those things, you know, for children, uh, they don't know what to do. They're getting beaten up and so on. So if they reach the counselors, the counselors will refer them, you know, all the options that are available to them. And one of them would be the legal side of it, which is child recovery, DVROs and things like that. So, you know, uh, so they all work in tandem. First, the counselors, they identify what the issues are, do the counselors, counseling and then if it needs a uh, uh, part of it is a legal solution then the lawyers take over others needs help out at home and so on and if anyone is showing signs and you feel that you can't help please refer them to the crisis center i've given you the numbers for empower pacific for lifeline our 1560 line toll free all these lines are, uh, are, are toll free please you know and and you know for men it doesn't make you less of a man in fact, you become out stronger. I've gone through counseling. I know men who have gone through counseling. We come out stronger after counseling, particularly when the other side has got the expertise around others' needs. You know, you come out stronger and you're able to deal with whatever you have. So please, nothing is so bad that you should take your life, you know, please seek help. I know it seems like that at that point in time. And other people around, you know, the support networks must be there for the women and for the children, for anyone who is going through any kind of uh, depression, stress, any mental health issues and so on. Your advice, uh, Stephanie? Mine is just simple, just reach out. We are all here together. There's always someone on the other line. Just reach out, someone will be there to help.